sorry, next speaker on stage, keynote speaker, uh, talking about deflation, Bitcoin, hyper Bitcoinization, that's always a fun one, and the future of wealth banking. I like that. All right, give it up for uh, my good friend, Sang, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Sagun, Sagun, yeah, come on. <laughs> hey, everyone. Uh, hope you're enjoying the day. Uh, we're almost at the uh, start of the evening. Uh, so hope I can kind of get you excited about uh, how, uh, uh, you know, the idea of deflation, hyper Bitcoinization looks like and the future of wealth banking. Um, yeah, so a quick background. I won't spend too much time, just one, one word. So I've been a serial entrepreneur. I speak a lot on the global uh, stage around Bitcoin. I'm a Bitcoin developer as well, a background of security protocols and computer science. Uh, this is what I work on mostly. So it's mostly oriented towards wealth banking. So it's Miniscript, uh, Music, Frost, uh, Bitcoin Enterprise Worlds, uh, Digital uh, Bitcoin Private Bank, and Bitcoin Inheritance, uh, an enterprise multi-custody. Uh, yeah, before we go further, very important. Uh, this session can kind of get you excited as well. So there's no financial advice here. Uh, it's only a point of view and uh, no speculation. Um, it is definitely speculation of how future looks like. So please don't take this as financial advice. Uh, before we jump into what's hyper uh, I think we need to take a feel of what hyper deflation is. Um, I think we talk about inflation, we talk about hyperinflation, but let's invert, right? completely invert this. So what's deflation, what's hyperdeflation? What is technological hyperdeflation is but a, a more better paraphrased question. So before we discuss hyperbitcoinization, I thought I'll just cover this quickly. So hyperdeflation refers to an extremely uh, large decreases in general of prices of goods and economy. Um, and it happens correspondingly large increases in money is purchasing power. power. So we actually experience the opposite today in most of the goods and services. The purchasing power is lost progressively year on year because of inflation. So uh, how have you ever experienced deflation? Quick show of hands. Anybody has experienced deflation before? I think we all experience it uh, with mobile phones, with your laptops, uh, with your electronic goods. We always see a better, higher quality of a product coming out but at a much more cost-effective price. So uh, this is Gary Tan, uh, the guy who now leads uh, Y Combinator, and he's talking about the effects of tech deflationary coming to humanity. And then the other side, you have Vinod Khosla, a very reputed uh, investor as well, also talking about huge deflationary uh, 25 years coming in front of us. So uh, there's a very important comment there. It says it depends on whether the scarce resource is capital or something else. So we have to gauge in the uh, field of deflation, uh, what will be the scarce resource. Um, so what are the triggers for technological hyper deflation? Um, and what is Bitcoin's role here before we say the era of hyper Bitcoinization is happening? So um, we believe that uh, AI and robotics, so imagine how many phones you all have, one phone per person, right? Two phones per person maximum, right? Imagine you being served with four robots, every person owning four robots, right? So you can actually start scaling and reducing the workforce price, the labor costs in future. And that's what AI and robotics will do. Nuclear energy will reduce uh, the cost per energy watt. Uh, quantum computing will solve at a more cost-effective rate and human longevity will sort of drive this. So we believe these are the four triggers. What does that mean? Um, so what you experience today in inflation is there are all other things except electronic goods. Electronic goods are already deflationary. All of those curves will flip down, right? So your purchasing power will keep on increasing. There will be a change in behavior. So this is what I've drawn a graph for how the price of hard disk and storage has reduced over the years on the left hand side. So you see the cost per GB has significantly dropped to the extent that we don't even care about the photographs that we click and keep in our phone. We don't think about uh, you know a challenge of changing our phone because you're losing a lot of uh, cloud storage. Well, every price is like a hard drive price in the deflationary world. So you will see behaviors of human being changing towards 
low time preference. Have you heard that word before? That's where the word comes from, yeah? Low time preference. Bitcoin is going to play a big role to help you measure. So think of Bitcoin more like a metric system, like kilometers, miles, kilograms, meters, right? We, unless, until we did not have a measuring system, a metric system, it was very difficult to measure things around. In a hyper-deflationary world where everything falls down significantly in price, how will you still measure? That's where the finite supply of 21 million coins is beautiful. That's how we will have finally a metric system that will measure the unit of GDP account that you would like to kind of gauge how the world will move. So that's the role Bitcoin will play. And that's why Bitcoin will in itself not drive hyperdeflation. Bitcoin will become a tool in the hyperbitcoinization era. And that's why it's called hyperbitcoinization. So I hope you got the the ruler at the bottom. <laughs> it's that's Bitcoin's role there. Oh. Uh, yeah, and this is a very famous meme, I just thought I'll show this. So, uh, we are currently here, weak men create hard times. Uh, I'm not <laughs> going to say a lot of political uh, discontentment across the world is probably here. And this is typically a four stage cycle that humanity repetitively goes. So if you study enough history, you'll see us going through hard times, creating strong men, and that's where the Bitcoin cycle started. So. We're still sort of crossing this era and we'll probably land up into hyper-Bitcoinization. So uh, this is Manhattan. Uh, what, what wealth then means in the future if you're already in hyper-Bitcoinization zone, right? So uh, this used to be called as New Amsterdam when it was colonized first. 10,000 people moved in um, to this land. It looked like this. And then eventually after the Dutch, UK colonized it and it became uh, known as New York uh, or Manhattan, right? Um, uh, it's pretty well known. Michael Saylor calls this as uh, the Bitcoin being the new cyber Manhattan. So this is how the cyber Manhattan looks like, right? So this is only 10,000 people. This is 8 million people, right? Now imagine in the cyberspace when you kind of land up with your Bitcoin in place, then you're actually going towards new cyber Manhattan. So you can start thinking of Bitcoin as a digital store of value, which has been talked a lot. Um, and if you're looking to start and build something in some of these spaces, uh, I, I personally believe uh, wealth banking is, is a lot that's kind of not been spoken about. Uh, your entire focus uh, lands up either on an exchange or a wallet business, but uh, if you really think of these use cases, these are very interesting use cases to build, um, which can be monetized today. Uh, there are customers looking to build, uh, to kind of have solutions on the institution side for something around store of value, Bitcoin treasury, institutional custody, inheritance planning. So that's some idea for you to kind of see where you could potentially work. So when will Bitcoinization happen? Also, now we've understood, so what does it take, right? Um, so initially, uh, let's get the order of events clear. Um, so it was used as a collectible in the early five years. It's starting to show properties of store of value in the last 15 years. And uh, we are discussing a lot about L2 technologies like Lightning Network, Liquid, and the other L2s, which basically talk about medium of exchange. So there's somewhere in between store of value and medium of exchange, and then unit of account. It kind of really mimics how we looked at gold credit cards, uh, and then also, you know, kind of using mobile payments. So the same four events that I showed to you is now spread over a, a lot more detailed events. And I think we're here somewhere. So the star that you see at the center. So large institutions and state adoption and reliable store of value. The X axis is time. The medium of exchange is still far away. So a lot of research companies, protocol companies are okay to build, but as an entrepreneur, if you're building something on the sides of, uh, you know, lightning, then you're, if you're a B2C company, you're going to have a hard time uh, monetizing directly. And that's why a lot of VCs today also on the panel said it's a little long ro longer road to monetize. So if you're really looking to build something that can be monetized immediately, the store of value should be our focus. Solutions around store of value for either individuals or institutions. 
So store of value, medium of exchange, and when you actually have the black circle, it when it becomes a unit of account when it can play all three properties together. Right. So this will be the end hyper mechanization era that today it only is playing the role of store of value, maybe medium of exchange and definitely not unit of account except these conferences. So you mostly see conferences where you can buy a coffee with snacks. That's the only place where your coffee is denominated in unit of account. Nowhere else, right? So it's still a big world out there. When you tell people my coffee will cost X amount of sats, the other guy who's not a Bitcoin will be like, I don't understand. So unit of account will take time. And this is very important. So this is what I'm alluding to. Uh, these are adoption curves, S curves. They're very famous. A lot of uh, VCs talk about S curves of technology, technology adoption. You cannot beat these curves. Uh, markets behave in certain way, uh, and when you're also building, and that's why our emphasis is a big uh, emphasis on store of value. So store of value is where wealth banking use cases come through. Medium of exchange is where you know lightning blooms or liquid blooms a lot more. But you look at the years; it's probably 2034 when it starts to take off. Uh, so lightning labs doing a great job. Other research protocols doing a great job. We can do that, but if you're looking to build something in this space, then medium of exchange can typically be very challenging to monetize, is what I meant. And then obviously the unit of account. So if you see the progression of all the four stages, I'm actually showing you adoption curves. Either you can join this store of value journey or you can fight the other two curves forcibly from now till 2034 or till 2044. Anybody can spend Bitcoin on this line? Show of hands, anybody? Anybody, I'll give you 5,000 cents after this as a prize. <laughs> Can you start? Yes? Where is it? Okay, there. Thank you. There's a woman in the green. So I purposely didn't choose you, <laughs> the organizer. So um, yeah, you're right. So Bitcoin is that one small speck on the top left corner, 1.4 trillion. Do you see the other stuff? What's all of that? That's traditional wealth. That's where wealth banking operates. That's where private banks serve all of these different asset classes to manage for a fee. That's where a business model is. Guess what? Bitcoin's just starting. Out of 900 trillion global asset value, you only have 1.4 trillion being given away. Right? Okay? So you need to nibble more. You need to nibble more. You need to capture more. That's exactly what I'm trying to highlight to you. I'm showing you numbers. Why even as a store of value, it's not there yet. It's starting very early. Anybody thinking late to the party, late to Bitcoin? <laughs> this is a factual data point. You're not late. You're very early. You're super early. So if you think you're late, no, you're not. There's a lot to build. So this is exactly, if I go back to this curve, right? Sorry, this one. The store of value has not happened. It's starting 2025, yet in 2024. That use case is starting and beginning to happen, right? Store of value will play out. Numbers are backing it. You're very early in this game, right? How does hyper Bitcoinization look like? Right? Like this. It takes over one fourth of it, $200 trillion of assets. And that happens in the next 10 years, by the way. So how is Bitcoin going to demonetize the other asset classes? So if you look at the Bitcoin capture, it starts to eat away from every different store of value, right? Finally, houses will become more cost effective because they will not be used as store of value. And all of those numbers translate over to a percentage taken away by Bitcoin as to a value in the next 10 years. Right now, we'll continue to develop. The question is, who's going to build use cases for store of value on the wealth banking side and monetize customers, right? Where is the potential use case of monetizing this? How will it happen, right? So this is a little busy slide, but it's typically used by other startups a lot. This is standard Bitcoin adoptions uh, bell curve, and on the other side is the S curve that I talked about. Right? And we're still in this 2.5% innovators. How many of you are using hardware wallets? Sure, friends, hardware wallets, love hardware wallets. Awesome, awesome. Walk across the street, talk to somebody, hardware wallets, nobody wants to use it. 
no way. Because we're all innovators. We're all progressive people who are ahead of the curve. We like technology, we like the complexity, but no, no, not the early adopters, not the early majority. So if store of value will happen, new types of wallet businesses will come in. You potentially have the opportunity to build one for yourself. And that is where the future of wealth banking will also look like. Because you're talking about becoming, becoming the supreme highest store of value play. And for that, you need a lot of different wallet management capability for the average Joe. The hardware wallets are not going to work out. It's a step in a direction of this. So it's only going to take off next 10 years. We've, we've spent 15 years here. It's a non-linear graph. So don't, don't compl complicate it in your mind by thinking, oh, maybe another 15 or 30 years out. Exponential curves as part of the S-curve typically goes very fast. So it will be most probably 10 years when this will happen, a short time. So all those people who started spend 15 years, be happy. You probably have a chance to kind of build something in the next 10 years. So this is exactly the same curve. I just want to let you know that this is classic crystal growth model. Go and look it up later on. Uh, if you're building something or if you intend to build, you can't beat these curves. These are very standard, 60 years. A lot of startups, a lot of VCs have looked at this and they believe a lot of adoption happens in this way. So, and then hyperbitcoinization. If you see on the, on, on the extreme red side, store of value first, medium of exchange, and then unit of account. We spoke about this, right? So how it fits onto that S curve and the bell curve. So I, I mean, this is available on Glassnode, a great place to see statistics around uh, different holders, hardlers in the Bitcoin side, harmful to the shrimps, right? That's how we classify Bitcoiners when we hold certain Bitcoin. And if you look at 2021 to 2023, um, our fundamental belief in our research shows that uh, in the next 10 years, a lot of clubs, retailer, investors, wealthy HMIs, unfortunately, will be weaker hands in comparison to institution governments and central banks. So a lot of them are coming for your Bitcoin. You will easily yield to them at a price point that you are gullible at for your own personal dreams. And hence, a lot of that Bitcoin will move. Again, it's an opinion, but typically research has shown and also has proven over the years that the biggest players who will eventually hold the Bitcoin once they realize the power of this, which a lot of institutions are beginning to believe that they can do this, you will end up yielding your Bitcoin. So one, how can you build for a lot of these people to not yield is important. Second, if you believe this thesis is right, are you building for the governments, institutions, central banks? Are you building tech for them? That's fair. You have to follow Bitcoin if you want to yield revenue. Unless you don't provide services for these institutions, banks, individuals, how are you potentially planning to make money, right? So you have to follow Bitcoin if you really want to kind of uh, generate revenue and profits, and that will be by working for custody for them. Again, store of value narrative, 10 years will still play out, right? So that's important. I wanted to just show you again with some numbers. And that's how, this is very famous, right? If, if, not, if you've not done this exercise, you should do this exercise, right? Go home today, take some number from me today. Uh, price your house, your real estate, or your dearest asset like gold in Bitcoin, denominated in 2017 price, and then 2022, and then 2024. You will see continuously fall off your, of your asset value denominated in Bitcoin. That's another way to say, you are losing your net worth your wealth when denominated in Bitcoin terms. You might not realize if you do it in fiat terms, in a certain economy, you will feel, feel oh, 3x, 2x, 1.5x. My house went up 1.5x. But if you do it in Bitcoin, you'll realize it's falling. So this is what that curve represents. Typically, all other assets are inferior to Bitcoin. And we have demonstrated over the last 10 years that they all relatively keep falling to Bitcoin. The other exercise, the old exercise that people used to do this was for gold. So you would denominate your entire house in the gold price and check after five years how it is. This is very important. If you're losing wealth or store of value invisibly, it is not visible to you. In your fiat, it shows it goes up, but it's actually falling. 
So if you bring questions to your mind, whether your investment strategy is right at personal level or at any investment level, wealthy class. So it's important. So this is what is going to happen. Again, an opinion. So all the other asset classes will lose their monetary premium. And the monetization of that monetary premium will actually go towards Bitcoin, right? So uh, a lot of private banks think about this. Uh, I work for a private bank. The idea is that we continuously think about how wealth can be protected for the richest people around the world. And that is some of this thought process that a lot of this AUM will move, right? So you have to think for yourself as well or for a startup that you build. Well, then comes the question of inheritance, right? <laughs> if you want to preserve this, the idea of Bitcoin is this, it's all about your next generation, right? How do you preserve wealth and pass it on to the next generation? And that's why Bitcoin inheritance is interesting. There's a very famous, interesting name, one Bitcoin for a kid, per kid, right? Uh, do you have it ready for, for, for your future? And this is a very important thought process. So, the beauty is you do on-chain inheritance without a trust. Trusts typically are used as vehicles by a lot of wealthy people to manage in a jurisdiction all the assets in that jurisdiction and tax planning, right? But you can do on-chain Bitcoin inheritance. You will only be working with the chain. That essentially means there is no other vehicle in place. Cut it every 10 minutes, by the way, whether your wealth is intact or not. Look at geopolitical risks like Ukraine, Russia, like Israel. There are so many risks. So when you plan in any estate, it can be at the mercy of a jurisdiction. Whereas, remember, cyber Manhattan? No problem. <laughs> so Bitcoin inheritance, think about this. So uh, this is basically an entire view of what products can be bought in the market. So if you really think about products that can allow you to do this, you know, some, some of these companies that are doing, so if, if, if you don't want to get into the complexity and you have access to the US markets or Japanese markets, you can potentially just buy number go up technology, which is MicroStrategy, MetaPlanet. So you're indirectly still working in the old traditional way of having a security account, access to US markets, buy equity and then you're okay. But otherwise you can buy ETFs, which got approved this year. Exciting brings more mass adoption. And then we have the traditional ways of doing delegated custodial setup. Now a lot of private banks have started to offer. We also offer uh, already since 2019, DBS recently announced. And then you have collaborative custody solutions where you, if you want a recovery pathway, if you're not confident, you might lose your own Bitcoin, a collaborative custody solutions are generally recommended. So you could look at some of those other players. And then there are some other exciting risk behaviors of trading derivatives and perks on Bitcoin, and that's more on the smart contract side. All of this is a different kind of custodial versus self-custody challenge versus simplicity and complexity, right? So as you come towards this, it's simplicity, but the risks are higher. Nobody has control which one of these companies ends up selling Bitcoin tomorrow. Right? So it's important uh, whether how close you want to be to a Bitcoin versus the complexity of a tackle. And that's where the opportunity is. That can, that extreme side could be simplicity as well. As an entrepreneur, you could really build and solve for this. Right? Unsolved, huh? Unsolved problem. <laughs> if you believe rather this is solved in the last 15 years, none of this is solved. So, yeah. And I already told you about the 2034 year, right? So we are actually uh, also amidst a lot of AIH, quantum longevity. All of that is going to get combined for your hyperdeflation. And Bitcoin will play a role as a ruler. It will help you measure your wealth. Bitcoin will not trigger the hyperdeflation. Bitcoin will be a tool in hyperdeflation. So when you have infinity, you have finite 21 million Bitcoins playing a role of playing as a ruler, a metric system to measure the GDP economic output of borderless across the world, right? It's the end of it. So, uh, yeah, you can watch some previous talks of what I've done previously on Miniscript Bitcoin traditional banks. Uh, we believe banks are going to be a big channel of distribution for Bitcoin in the future. Whether that's true or not, we will see. Uh, uh, it's time will only tell, but yeah, uh, I'm available outside afterwards. Happy to take some of those questions. Yeah.